First, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Social Ethics uh, Society, uh, in, partic in particular Peter, for um, inviting me to be part of uh, the eighth uh, annual conference uh, of the Society. Uh, it's, a, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. It's my first time to be here in Lake Cebu. And uh, the minute that, uh, the moment that I learned that it's going to be held, that the conference is going to be held here, I already, I already said yes to Peter right away. Um, and it's uh, uh, serendipitous also that uh, I'm currently working on uh, a project that I have, uh, I've planned to work on already uh, a few years back, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just now that I found time to uh, lay down some of my ideas regarding the, uh, you know, the theme that I'm going to share with you today. So um, the title of my presentation is uh, Critical Theory in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. An initial report of the case of five Filipino intellectuals. Uh, it's. Uh, I'd like to uh, um, uh, declare some disclaimers first. Um, I, I don't have a full-blown paper yet. Um, if you are interested, uh, there's. Um, I actually presented this, or well, not this, but my initial ideas in one of our work in progress seminars in in USD. And it's uh, also um, uh, available through the Critique website. If you know the website of Critique, uh, you just uh, visit the website, you go to the Metaphorica section, and then you can already download um, the uh, file or the, uh, the podcast of that specific um, uh, work in progress seminar where I presented my initial ideas on the theme. Uh, I've made some progress, okay, uh, well, because when I, uh, I initially presented my ideas, I didn't have a PowerPoint presentation. Today, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I made some progress, and I've written down some of my thoughts also. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of what uh, Brother Carl did yesterday. I'm going to um, 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 uh, rely on my PowerPoint presentation, and I'm also going to do some a little bit of what uh, Brother Romy um, did yesterday, which was to read uh, his paper. Oops. All right, there you go. All right. <clears throat> Critical theory is profoundly Western. It's a profoundly Western and distinctly European narrative. What this means is that as an initial or as an intellectual practical discourse, critical theory had originally drawn its normative force from the social and political events that transpired in Europe over the course of the 20th century. My presentation will, however, demonstrate at least two things. Firstly, I will show that there is a strong intellectual practical current in the Philippines today that appropriates some important normative tenets of the Frankfurt School. This current has developed over the past decade and maybe even before and is, and is represented by five Filipino intellectuals mainly from the fields of philosophy, uh, anthropology, uh, namely, and, and philosophy and anthropology in particular, namely, Carl Gaspar, Agustin Martin Rodriguez. We're very lucky that Brother Carl is with us today. And as a matter of fact, I don't need to say much because he already said everything that I wanted to say yesterday. So uh, I'd like to thank him for that. So uh, Brother Carl, Agustin Martin Rodriguez uh, from Ateneo, Adranilo Hermida, also from Ateneo, Renato Pilapil from the and Jeffrey Okai from Siliman. Uh, it's my first time to do this, right? It's my first time to um, uh, um, present a paper specifically on Filipino intellectuals. I hope to briefly, what I want to do is to, to th I want to do two things at least. I hope to briefly present a survey 
of their res respective contributions that deal with issues such as struggle for recognition, struggle for and for recognition of in indigenous cultural identity, as we have already discussed yesterday, governance amidst the multiverse of reason, imagining democracy in the third world, and the possibility of emancipative utopia inspired by local communities. Secondly, I intend to argue that apart from the fact that there is a budding Frankfurt School inspired discourse among Filipino intellectuals, there is something philosophically and practically fecund that mainstream critical theory could learn from the margins of an already marginal country like the Philippines. So my operative word or idea is therefore the word margin or the marginal. In other words, the marginal, that is to say, peripheral social groups like the Lumad, as opposed to the mainstream, might offer us utopian and practical possibilities for socio-political emancipation. So that's actually the, the, the main argument that I want to, uh, you know, to, 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 to share or to shed light on. Uh, although, of course, Brother Carlos already given us perhaps the best way to present that uh, so-called emancipative utopia. In other words, the marginal, sorry, uh, uh, I borrowed the notions, in order to uh, paint a picture of what I want to say, I borrowed the notions of the multiverse of reason from uh, Gus Rodriguez and the idea of philosophy at the margins from Jeffrey Ochai. In order to articulate a brand of critical theory that, while inspired by the Frankfurt School's clamor for the abolition of social injustice, it draws its normative force from the standpoint of the multiplicity of communities and the images of emancipative utopia that these communities foster. So that, uh, hopefully that will, uh, is something that will be drawn out from my presentation. So another thing that I want to do before I um, discuss brief, by the way, this is not a, a detailed uh, presentation or discussion of the ideas of the five intellectuals that I mentioned. I'm merely going to present uh, the basic, you know, very, very, very basic ideas. And uh, what, I, what I want to do is simply to, to, to show you that uh, there are intellectuals in the Philippines that are interested in the ideas of the critical theorists and that they are applying these ideas in their own work. Um, but first, let's define what is critical theory, so that we, uh, we, we understand uh, what is it that they're trying to do in their works, right? Um, I've done this a hundred times, meaning defining critical theory this way. And uh, what I do is, I uh, draw. I, I have drawn ideas from uh, the uh, uh, father of critical theory, who is uh, Max Horkheimer. A good theoretical starting point for making sense of social recognition. Sorry, for making sense of what critical theory is, is by revisiting the basic normative claims laid down in. Um, the work of the essay of Max Horkheimer called Traditional versus Critical Theory, uh, which was published in the 30s. Uh, so firstly, and I've laid, laid out the three normative claims. Firstly, critical theory presupposes that reality is necessarily social reality. So, uh, We've been talking about our relationship with nature yesterday, but that is also social. What this means is that the environment we inhabit is largely a product of human intervention. Through philosophy, science, technology, and also religion, cultural practices, and so on, we produce our own historical way of life in its totality. So critical theory, therefore, perceives our social normative practices imminently within the social structures we have invented, 
that supposedly promote what we can refer to as social cohesion. Secondly, the practical goal of critical theory is the emancipation from slavery. Uh, so the praxeological goal is the emancipation from slavery in the abolition of social injustice. This presupposition is based on a kind of pre-political assumption that at the core of every human being is the interest to be free. A kind of what Habermas calls quasi, actually it's, it comes from Habermas, but uh, Axel Honneth reappropriates it and Honneth calls it quasi-transcendental interest. Uh, it is not necessary to conceive of this quasi-transcendental interest in essentialist terms. At best, it is a practical assumption, yet an assumption that runs all across various social groups. One example of a quasi-transcendental interest is our belief that human beings are dignified. In other words, we don't have any proof for that. Uh, another good example is what uh, Brother Romy uh, discussed last uh, yesterday. He said that all our ethical actions, moral actions, are based on the good, the moral good. Okay, but we don't have basis for that. We don't have a basis for. It. We can all, all we can argue that the moral good comes from some kind of natural, you know, uh, source. Uh, so therefore, we uh, invoke the idea of natural law and so on. Uh, we can also um, come up with arguments, uh, normative arguments, such as uh, our ideas of the good are based on our social environment and language and social interactions and so on. Uh, whatever idea or whatever uh, just whatever justification that we come up with in order to to uh, qualify or to buttress our idea that there's such thing as the good or goodwill, rather. Goodwill, I think that word is goodwill. Uh, we don't have any uh, ontolo uh, you know, uh, basis for it. So what we do is simply, is simply to assume that indeed all humans have this natural propensity to, you know, to, to rationally think of good, or rationally base their actions on the goodwill. All right? Uh, that is an example of a quasi-transcendental interest. Therefore, quasi-transcendental interests are necessary. Otherwise, if we don't assume that there, there's, uh, the others, we don't assume things like goodwill or justice or dignity, uh, then there's no point in doing philosophy. There's no point in doing critical theory. There's no point in living, as a matter of fact, if we don't assume these things. So, the th and therefore, the third norm, and we now go to the third normative claim. The third normative claim, or presupposition of critical theory, is that the emancipation, emancipatory impulse is not confined to proletarian sensibilities. Right? So, in other words, uh, the critical theories have already, in as much as they are, um, um, uh, Mar they are Marxist, but they are also veered away from the idea that emancipation is only possible through the proletarian class. So what the, what this entails is that the des it, it entails the decentralization of the role of the proletariat and the re recognition of the emancipatory potential of any social group informed by a pre-political demand for social freedom. So, uh, if we put these three normative claims together, then we will have a working description or definition of what critical theory is trying to do. Uh, critical, of course, again, if we rehearse critical theories, critical theorists think that uh, Reality is necessarily social reality. So most of our problems are actually caused by anthropological causes, right? And therefore, if we are going to try to solve these problems, these so-called so social pathologies, 
then we also need resources, anthropological resources to be able to solve them. Uh, and why do we need to solve them? Because uh, the normative, the practical, political goal of critical theory is to emancipate us from slavery and uh, hopefully to, ab to abolish social injustice caused by our anthropological, you know, um, activities, for lack of a better word. Uh, but then, uh, going beyond Marx, to be more specific, going beyond uh, Georg Lukács, because it was, it was Lukács who, uh, you know, introduced the idea, not, it, it was, um, who, who introduced Marxism to the Western world, to be more specific. And in his book, um, um, History of, 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 of uh, Class Consciousness, he talked about uh, the emancipation of the proletariat, and he argued that it is only by developing a proletariat consciousness that emancipation is possible. That, that, that the, the possibility of imagining emancipation takes place. Um, the critical theorists have, uh, well, they, they appreciate that, that, that argument from Lukács, but they say, no, uh, emancipation could, ha could happen anywhere. It could, it could develop in any social group, All right? So, uh, therefore, uh, those are the three normative claims of critical theory. My position is that, critical, that, critical th that a critical theory of society, even beyond the Frankfurt School tradition, presupposes all three normative claims. However, I take as the strongest normative claim, the second claim, emancipation from slavery and the abolition of social injustice. I believe that this normative core of critical theory, as it provides the central qualitative dynamo of social, it, it, uh, it provides the critical qualitative dynamo of social critique. In other words, as a political practical content of social critique, what it articulates is the pre-political anthropological propensity towards freedom and justice. Right? Again, further, discla a further disclaimer, why did I choose the five intellectuals? Well, you might be probably wondering why I chose the five intellectuals, but there's really no, so I'm not presenting an elite list of intellectuals, okay? So, um, I'm not, uh, I call this, um, coming up with a canon for uh, critical theory in the Philippines. So, uh, don't worry. Okay, I'm not um, discounting other intellectuals. There are many uh, Filipino intellectuals uh, who are interested in critical, in critical theory. Uh, my project is a work in progress, so I may add more people later on. Okay? There's no science behind my decision to only present the five intellectuals mentioned. The only gauge is my little familiarity with their respective works. So again, don't worry, uh, or rather, uh, maybe I'll, sometimes people ask me, so what is your framework in choosing the five intellectuals, right? As if I am a graduate student who's about to present his proposal. What is your framework in writing your thesis? Okay. You, know, you know what, most of the time we don't have, we have to do away with framework. Uh, otherwise, uh, and, and, and this is what I tell my grad students, what, one reason why if you have difficulty uh, writing your proposals because you're too preoccupied with your, the with your theoretical framework. Um, maybe uh, Peter paid heed to that, and so <laughs> he, he made progress. Um, so, uh, like again, so again, no science behind my decision, and just familiar with, with, with some of their works. And so, to pay tribute to them, I'm trying to uh, share with you my initial, uh, you know, assessment of their contribution. 
My familiarity with their works is due to the fact that we share a common interest in the works of the Frankfurt School. Okay. While I consider the USC Department of Philosophy as a hub for the study of critical theory, I have chosen only to present the works of colleagues from other institutions. Um, because I also want to see how they appropriate critical theory in other schools. All right, so now uh, let me go to the five critical theories. Let me start, yeah, here. Actually, I should start here. Yeah, I'll start with, uh, first I'll start with, um, Gus Rodriguez. Agustin Martin Rodriguez, of course, from Ateneo de Manila University. His main work is, is called Governing the Other. Exploring the, dis the Discourse of Democracy in a Multiverse of Reason, published in 2009 by Ateneo Press. Uh, I recommend this work. It's, it's, it's a very unique book. Uh, it's a collection of his essays. He presented in various uh, uh, conferences and um, also published in various journals. Now, uh, what, does Gus, the, what, what does he do here in this book? He problematizes the notion of just governance against the backdrop of Philippine society, which he describes as a multiplicity of communities with competing conceptions of the good. So the main observation of Rodriguez is that it seems like Filipinos are ungovernable, right? Uh, it's, it seems like Filipinos don't accept uh, the uh, Filipino state, the Philippine state, the Philippine government as a legitimate institution. And because they don't accept the uh, Philippine government as a legitimate institution, Filipinos, especially those who are from the periphery, the poor in particular, according to Rodriguez, uh, live their lives according to their own, uh, you know, normative resources, meaning they come up with their own rationalities, their own respective peculiar rationalities. Now, so the argument is, um, and this is the twist, and this, this is why I like the book, the twist in, in Rodriguez's argument is, sometimes we create the wrong uh, assumption that, well, uh, rationality this would be the Philippine government, right? Um, is considered reason, okay, mainstream reason, and as, as a, and in contrast to that are those uh, um, ways of life that are not, uh, you know, are not uh, ad, that, that have not adopted fully to the uh, you know the the, the uh, mainstream. Reason, and so uh, because they have not embraced reason in that context, they are ungovernable. Okay. The twist in in Gus's argument is, no, these are also ration, rationalities. There are reason. There, uh, so yeah, in other words, we cannot uh, we we cannot always. Uh, in other words, we cannot look at them arrogantly and say, eh, you, uh, you, you violate, uh, let's say you violate ordinances and so on. Why are you selling your goods uh, along the uh, sidewalk, right? Why are you violating traffic rules? Why are you building your shanties in that piece of land that you don't own and so on, okay? Uh, therefore, you are irrational because you don't uh, conform to the uh, uh, law prescribed by uh, the state. Okay, so therefore, you're, un you're, you're ungovernable, you are irrational. The argument of Gus is um, that is an arrogant position uh, because uh, th these are also rational ways of living. So what he wants to say is that the Philippines is actually 
a multiverse, okay, a multiverse of reason. We have different, okay, sometimes conflicting reasons or rationalities to be more. So ultimately, by identifying the problem of a multiverse or multiverse of reason, Rodriguez articulates the principle of gover governance that may bind us as a people with a shared common good. But then, because he follows Habermas, uh, by, well, after identifying the problem, which is to him not exactly a problem, but uh, I, I, he identifies the, what he thinks as the basic ontological, if you want, basic social ontological structure of Philippine society, which is a multiverse of, of rationalities. How can we, so the, the question now is, how can we bind all these different opposing rationalities together uh, based on one common idea of the good? And so therefore, how, so it's very Habermasian, right? Uh, uh, against the backdrop of differences, how can we come up or how can we agree on one thing? So that while preserving our peculiar rationalities, we also participate in a common idea of the good. And so therefore, if we agree to participate in the common uh, sphere of the good, then we, while we can live our own peculiar lives, we also participate in uh, governance. Or participate in running the state. Uh, so that is the, uh, the the problem posed by the book, and, and Rodriguez tries to come up with a solution via Habermas. So following Habermas, Rodriguez proposes a notion of a discursive democracy, uh, which is just uh, I think uh, uh, basically. Uh, an inflection from Habermas' idea of pragmatics, right? Uh, discursive Russia, discursive democracy, and discursive democracy, according to Gus, it, it, it builds solidarity by encouraging a politics of participation and empowerment. Okay, very positive, very optimistic. Not uh, my impression, however, is that he didn't really. But by borrowing this from Habermas, oh, he only changed the he only changed the word and replaced it with discursive. Okay. Um, but that while I, I like the idea of the multiverse of reason, I'm not too sure though if Habermas, uh, by, or by simply invoking the idea of discursive democracy uh, because of this very very ideal right um, because if you it, the thing is that and I will go to the idea of of, uh, of democracy later on uh, the problem is that Habermas un un understands the idea of pragmatics in the context of um, developed democracies, right? Um, I'm not sure if the Philippines is a developed democracy. Uh, we have a very good constitution, because they're trying to change. Uh, the problem is not with, and Peter and I had a conversation about this in the car. Uh, the problem is not with the theories that we have. It's not with the formal structures of our laws. It's how we implement the law, that's the problem. So, uh, the, the problem is if we don't have a democratic framework, I mean, I mean, if people don't have democratic mindset, a democratic mindset, a discursive democracy will not work. Okay. Now let's go to Brother Carl, I'm, I'm going to be careful now. <laughs> so like, like I said, uh, everything that I wanted to say 
uh, was already were already mentioned uh, was already mentioned by Brother Carl yesterday. Uh, don't need, I don't need to. I have an introduction here, but I don't need to read that anymore. We all know Brother Carl already. Um, his book, however, is called Manobo Dreams in Arakan: So keep a people struggle to keep their homeland. I'm, I'm just to share with you an anecdote. I, I cherish this book because Brother Carl gifted me this book in 2012, when the, the first time that we met, and um, he has an autograph. So I'll, I'll, ch I'll cherish that book, Brother Carl. Thank you very much for that. Um, so fueled by uh, Brother Carl's deep interest in Luwag, or non-Muslim indigenous people in Mindanao, the book exposes how the Manobo is fighting to reclaim their ancestral homelands from logging corporations in the state, and how this struggle has been exacerbated by militarization and so on. We know the story. We already know the story. So uh, what's special about the book of Brother Carl is it's, it's perhaps the most comprehensive account of the life of, or the lives of the Manobo. But well, why am I interested in this, uh, at least for this presentation, why am I interested in Brother Khan's book? Because he also used the Habermasian framework. So, uh, Manobo Dreams in Arakan presents a histor historical, sociological, and anthropological account of the Arakan Monobo experience. What I wish to focus on, however, is Brother Carl's use of the Habermasian framework in presenting his narrative of the Arakan Monobo. So, uh, he borrows two key ideas from Habermas, namely communicative rationality and the idea also of life, world, and system. Now, if, uh, if, we, if, you allow, if, you, if we're going to rehearse these ideas, I think a majority of us are already familiar with the idea of communicative rationality. Um, I suppose, to some extent, Brother Carl shares this idea of a multiplicity of rationalities with Gus Rodriguez. Um, the worldview of uh, the Luma or the indigenous people cannot be contrasted to reason, as if they are not reasonable people, as if their ways of life are irrational. And I think that has been presented quite well yesterday. However, I'd like to, to um, take this to take advantage of the, this opportunity to ask Brother Carl a question, which I failed to ask yesterday because we ran out of time. But I want to ask, because his, uh, his argument was uh, that there's such thing as indigenous Filipino philosophy. I'm oh, sorry, indigenous philosophy, right? My question is, is it a case of searching for indigenous philosophy or a case of allowing or paving the way for indigenous worldviews to enter the mainstream of academic discourse? Uh, because we also have, in Manila, we have this ongoing debate on what is Filipino philosophy. And I'm part of the group that is a bit wary about, uh, you know, looking for uh, an essential Filipino philosophy. Uh, not that, my argument is that, or my position is, not that there's no Filipino philosophy. There is philosophy everywhere. We do philosophy, we do academic philosophy, in the words of Brother Carl and the other, and even from other disciplines, they use philosophical ideas, right? Um, uh, I think the issue is not whether there is Filipino or indigenous uh, ways of life. Uh, another question is, can we equate or um, our, let's say, worldview 
and philosophy the same. If we understand the worldview of an indigenous group, and therefore shall we dub that philosophy? Um, or uh, simply, in other words, simply this world, these worldviews can do without philosophy. But because we're trying to understand these worldviews, we need to allow them to enter the mainstream of academic discourse. And so my other question is, maybe we don't need really to look for uh, Filipino mm -hmm. philosophy or indigenous worldviews, they are there. We just need to uh, we just need to understand them and embrace them and let them enter our discourse, our academic discourse, and let them enrich our philosophy. Uh, and so, in other words, um, I have my, it's not a bias; more of my training, maybe. Um, I I, I understand because I understand philosophy as an academic endeavor. So therefore, I'm open to the idea, and, and I do agree that we need to we need to read more of our own literature, our own uh, local literature, our own indigenous literature. This is the only way that our philosophical, our academic activity, i.e. philosophy, can be enriched. So it's the other way around. I'm proposing another way of... Uh, my, my question now is, can, can philosophy learn from indigenous worldviews? And that's my argument actually later on. Can critical theory learn from the margins? Alright? So, um, uh, life, world, and system. Uh, life, I, I think... Uh, what Brother Carl wants to do here, or in the book, is that he wants to say that the Manovo has a specific worldview that we neglect, right? And therefore, this worldview should come into the mainstream of our discourse, or discourses, so, so that we will understand uh, them, and that they are not other, they are not other that we, need, that, that, that we should ignore. Um, of course, he in the book he tries to talk about the the dialectics between life, world, and system, in as, in as much as system takes over the life world, indigenous community, and therefore destroys that life world, destroys that community, which is precisely what what is happening or what happened, right? So so I I, I guess, uh, but but Brother Carl can correct me later on. I guess the idea is. How can uh, we not allow systems to take over indigenous worldviews, and so that we will not destroy, uh, you know, indigenous cultures? Um, all right. So uh, we can. Um, I, I'm. I'm going to uh, lay this down for discussion. Further discussions. I now go to the next intellectual, Ramil Hermida from Atene de Manila. His main work is called Imagining the Mo Modern Democracy, a Habermasian assessment of the Philippine experiment published in 2014 by SUNY University, or SUNY, State University of New York Press. And what uh, Hermida wants to do is to examine the political reality in Philippine society today against the vision and rhetoric of its present constitution. The framework employed for the assessment is the theory of law and democracy of Jürgen Habermas. So, uh, I think the, the framework is quite straightforward. Um, we have the 1987 constitution. Uh, is it democratic enough? How are we going to know or, or gauge that it's democratic enough? So what Hermida did was to use Habermas as a uh, litmus, litmus test for the Philippine Constitution. Does it pass, does the Constitution pass the test, uh, sorry, 
Does the Philippine Constitution pass the Habermasian test? In other words. Um, but of course, it does say some disclaimers there. Um, like for example, I already mentioned it earlier, Habermas uh, uh, understands democracy in the context of uh, developed democracies, highly developed states, highly developed societies. So, um, uh, and th th that, po that poses a problem in this framework because it, if Habermas base is, if the Habermas framework is based on, um, you know, highly developed democracies, then how could that work in the Philippines? How could that be used as a litmus, lit litmus test for Philippine democracy? Um, so, uh, so, in a, so Hermida uses the Habermasian framework as a criteria for critique and evaluation of democratic potential and practice in the Philippines. Um, but, but again, there's, there's, it seems to me that uh, there are problems in the, the problems in the way uh, that is enacted in the book. Um, because, like I said, although Hermida already mentioned uh, mentions it, or, or although he also mentioned it in the book, um, um, is ha the question is: is, is, is the Habermasian framework the best framework to critique, uh, to gauge the validity of Philippine democracy? Uh, he, he he mentions that he admits that. But there's also another problem. Are Filipinos democratic enough? Are we democratic enough? Do, um, do we have a democratic mindset? Because if we don't have, we don't have a democratic mindset, democracy cannot work. The problem is that we have inherited democracy. It's not something that we develop from ground up. Okay? And we know that uh, we, we know, and we know that um, quite well. And so, and therefore, it's an alien system that has taken over our life worlds, i.e., the human experience. Um, and therefore, if that is the case, then how can how can an alien system like democracy become Legitimate. If it, if the if if uh, we assume that democracy should develop from ground up, but that's not the way democracy, that, that's not the history of democracy in the Philippines. It's a system, it's a rhetoric system that has been imposed on our indigenous life worlds, and so and therefore uh, we have a, a long history of of colonialism, and we are dealing with it in our neo-colonial discourses today, I think the LUMAD is, the LUMAD, um, this, uh, the LUMAD phenomenon, or the LUMAD discourse is part of that overarching discourse on neo-colonialism. Um, and so on. Uh, so, so that is a problem. So the thing is that Hermida uh, is also worried. Maybe it cannot work. But maybe, but this is how he goes around his problem. Well, um, we could we could aspire for whatever that is that Habermas uh, thinks as real democracy. Okay. So, but you know that that is the that is the promise of the book. So, uh, and then uh, the next uh, philosopher is uh, Ray Pilapil. Anyway, the publication of Renante Pelapil's Recognition Examining Identity Struggles, published by Ateneo Press in 2015, is a very welcome addition to the growing literature on recognition theory. Pelapil presents a book as a critical assessment of the current debates in recognition theory outlining its theoretical presuppositions, trends, and weaknesses, 
as well as its applicability in actual political life. While uh, Pilapil's interest in the philosophical study of recognition was urged by the very same theoretical issues that inspired early commentaries on recognition, such as the philosophical, such as the philosophical anthropology of recognition and the politics of identity and difference, the book goes beyond simply introducing recognition theory as a philosophical paradigm, having a practical personal motivation. So I'll pause there first. So the first three intellectuals were all Habermasian, right? But now we have Philippian who goes beyond Habermas. What he adapts and what, or rather, what he appropriated was the philosophy of recognition from Axel Honneth. So as a native of Mindanao, Tilapiel's philosophical journey has been profoundly motivated by his experience of the Muslim rebellion in Southern Philippines here in Mindanao. He says that he wants to understand the normative contents of the moral resistance and to make philosophizing more relevant to his own context. Right? Uh, to some degree, recognition is a pio the, the book is a pioneering work for a couple of reasons. It is the first book on recognition theory published in the Philippines. And it is also the first to use the moral struggle in, here in Mindanao as a test case for examining the normative validity of recognition theory. Ilapil puts it plainly, the struggle for recognition is particularly evident in the moral struggle in Muslim Mindanao. However, despite the Pilapis' acknowledgement of the struggle for recognition of the morals, one which he attempts to present against the backdrop of the recognition of identity and difference. Um, uh, All right, so. Uh, Pilapil acknowledges the struggle for recognition of morals, one which he attempts to present against the backdrop of the recognition of identity and difference. He does point out that such a struggle should not be taken as a given, but rather poses conceptual and practical problems. In this context, Pilapil argues that the normative justifications for formative recognition must be examined in order to answer why particular social groups deserve to be granted special rights on the basis of their identity recognition. And that's the uh, core of, of, uh, of, of Pilate's argument. No? Why should we grant special rights to specific groups? Um, and in this case, why should we grant special rights to the morals? Um, this, according to Pilapi, leads us to a question whether such clamor for identity recognition, which usually manifests as collective political resistance, is moral in the first place on account of the experience of misrecognition of these social groups, such, the, such as the morals. However, contextualizing the struggle for recognition of the morals required a long discussion of, this, of some of the main issues of recognition. Okay, uh, so uh, again, the, uh, the, the, uh, the most interesting, at least for me, the most interesting question that uh, Pilapil asked in the book is, why, uh, why is it necessary sometimes that we need to grant special rights to specific groups of what legitimizes that granting of special rights? Okay, so therefore the dialectic then, if in Habermas the dialectic is between communication and miscommunication, in Honneth the dialectic is between recognition and misrecognition. So the basic argument is, of course, we cannot discuss you know, critical, I mean, uh, recognition theory here. It takes one whole graduate course to do that. Uh, 
But if I'm going to simplify the logic of recognition, uh, you grant special rights to people, to a specific group of people, or to a person. It doesn't matter if it's one person, or a group of, a collect, or a collectivity, like the Luma, or the Moros, uh, or women, or students, it doesn't matter. But why should you, or the LGBT, why should you, why should you give them special rights? They are, they are already human beings. Aren't we human beings? Aren't we, don't we have the same rights then? But why should you, why should you, why should you give special rights to that, to that specific group? Uh, what legitimizes the granting of rights, of special rights? So the dialectic, the logic is uh, because there is misrecognition, meaning some form of social injustice happened. They have experienced some form of social injustice that we have not experienced. And maybe we are the cause of that social injustice. And so, para uh, makabawi, in other words, you have to you have to give them special rights. Uh, in other words, uh, it is because of misrecognition that recognition becomes, you know, a necessity becomes necessary. Okay, you can ask questions later uh, about recognition, or you can just uh, en enroll in the USC Graduate School. Or maybe, uh, I think Ray is teaching recognition also in Ateneo, right? Or you. Or, or uh, buy his book and read on recognition. The last. Uh, intellectual that I want to discuss is Jeffrey Okai. Let me just give you an anecdotal background. Uh, Jeff was when, when I was what well, we both did our our PhD in Macquarie. So I, I he came in two years after I started. Uh, and so, in other words, you body know? go So we have we've had long conversations uh, about critical theory, about the idea of of, of philosophy at the margins. Um, and uh, I, I we I tried to actually I, I struggled at first. I struggled. I, I was grappling with the idea of the possibility of philosophy at the margins. How is that possible? I asked him. And then through our discussions, uh, it was made, the idea was made um, clearer to me. Uh, among G5 intellectuals, it's only Jeff that doesn't have a book yet. Okay? But he has published quite a, a number of, uh, of, of, of essays that, if, <laughs> that when put together, Okay, they comprise one book on on critical theory. Um, uh, so, for, for instance, uh, his more for uh, his more um, foundational essays are actually found in Critique. Okay, he has three foundational essays in Critique, like Heidegger, Hegel, Marx, Marcuse, and the Theory of Historicity. Eroticizing Marx, Revolutionizing Freud, Marcuse's psychoanalytic turn. Uh, by the way, he wrote a dissertation on Mark on Herbert Marcuse. Um, third, technology, technological domination, the great refusal, Marcuse's critique of, of advanced industrial society. I consider these three as the foundational essays. Because they lay down, they lay down the basic notion of critical theory that Jeff still use this today, you know? And when we were and we were when we were having those long conversations over coffee and beer and kangaroo sometimes. Uh, uh, I've had the first hand experience of uh, discussing uh, the, the, some of the, con the the contents of those essays. Um, uh, after that, he uh, published uh, Shifting Pattern of Sophistication, 
and sophisticated American colonial domination in the Philippines, and then uh, technological domination and the transformation of Filipino mind. So using Marcuse, so the foundation of Marcuse, but what but, he, but his main argument is because we have been colonized and it we were colonized through technology and so on, um, even through religion, as a matter of fact, uh, that colonization changed our, not only our natural landscape, but also our psyche, right? Our mindset. And uh, the, the, the problems that we are discussing in this conference are actually related to what Jeff is trying to say. Um, and then the more mature ones, Hegel reframed Marcuse on the dialectical social transformation, ethics of refusal, globalization, and the penitent people's struggle for recognition. Towards the end, uh, Jeff became interested in recognition theory. So those are the two people that uh, that, that that you know supports uh, his uh, own brand of critical theory. Marcuse on the one hand and Axel Honneth on the other. Philosoph and here the, the title is Philosophy at the Margins, exploring philosophy of work of the ordinary people in some remote areas of Negros. Uh, I'll try to unpack what this means, philosophy at the margins. Uh, the, the other, the, the last essay is, not, is, is yet to be published. Uh, this is, the, uh, it's called The Peasant Movement and Great Refusal in the Philippines, Situating Critical Theory at the Margins. Uh, this is a paper he presented in the first Critical Theory Conference last December, when we celebrated the 10th anniversary, the 10th year anniversary of the journal. So we had a um, we had a, a a conference to celebrate the 10th year anniversary, and we invited him as one of the uh, speakers. As a matter of fact, he was there as the keynote. Also, Gus Rodriguez and uh, Randy Hermida were there as um, keynote speakers. And the title of the conference, the theme of the conference, conference was philosophy or critical theory at the margins. Which brings me now to the last point of my presentation. What is philosophy at the margins? Uh, Jeff says philosophy at the margins. I say critical theory at the margins. To be more specific, we, what what we, what what we are trying to imagine when we try to make sense of critical theory at the margins is specifically emancipative utopia. So is emancipative utopia possible at the margins? Or to phrase it, it's a work in progress. I'm trying to look for the right phrasing. Uh, can we draw emancipative utopian visions from the margins? That's another way of asking the question, right? So as pointed out earlier, Horkheimer, going back to the three normative claims of critical theory, Horkheimer understands critical theory as propounding a strong and social and political claim the emancipation from slavery, and the abolition of social injustice. That has been the underlying tenant, I suppose, of, uh, of, the, of the presentation. Critical theorists have always been staunch defenders of social justice and egalitarianism through their vocal criticisms of the ideological nature of capitalist culture and the oppressive tendencies of Western empires. While the, the, the birthplace of critical theory is Europe, I pointed out, as I pointed out earlier, earlier, its normative claims are nonetheless universal in as much as it lends an intellectual voice to the voiceless and articulate a notion of hope for the hopeless. 
In the context of the Philippine society, critical theory may play an instrumental role in analyzing social and political pathologies. And that has been shown already through the work of Brother Carr, uh, with his engagement with Luma, uh, shown in the works of Rodriguez and Hermida in, in, in their attempt to understand Philippine democracy and governance. Okay. Uh, and in the work of, of, of Jeffrey Okai, uh, in his attempt to uh, understand the intellectual history of domination in the Philippines, and later on develop you know, a critical theory based on the, and this is what I'm trying to do, I'm actually, this is nothing, this is not mine, I'm borrowing it from, from Jeff as a matter of fact. This idea of emancipative utopia, or, these are my terms, emancipative utopia. His term, his, his, he terms it as philosophy at the margins. I term it as emancipative, emancipative utopia from the margins. Um, so it has been shown that indeed some Filipino intellectuals appropriate ideas from, from critical theories. Um, so in the context of Philippine society, critical theory may play an instrumental role in analyzing social and political pathologies. Moreover, the complex history of the Philippines as a post-colonial nation with a neo-colonial culture has resulted in marginal spaces. The marginal spaces that profoundly inform Filipino identity and culture. We will have to deal with these marginal spaces. It's part of our uh, national identity. As such, the Philippines is a peculiar locus for the possibility of a critical theory of society that is characterized by, mar by these marginal spaces. Or, as Okai puts it, we may articulate a new form of struggle for recognition from the margins of the global system. While we may understand the word marginal, Why we may understand the word marginal in its negative form, usually referring to the disadvantaged members of society, it is also possible to construe marginal precisely as the obverse of the disadvantage. As there are subterranean cultures like, you know, what Brother Carl presented yesterday, there are subterranean cultures that are thriving, yet largely unrecognized or misrecognized. These subterranean cultures or alternative rationalities, as Rodriguez puts it, when given voice, may inspire new forms of normative modalities that could respond to various forms of social and political crisis thus instigating the possibility of hope and the activation of utopian visions. Another way of putting it is what we're experiencing as, new, as our new colonial uh, you know, predicament is actually a modern predicament. How, can we, how are we going to deal with this modern predicament? It's, a, it's part of the, the, the modernity problematic, right? Um, how, can, how can we deal with this modernity problem? Can we learn from the margins? Can the margins provide us with utopian visions that can emancipate us from you know, our bondage to moder modern, uh, to, you know, the, 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 the uh, quat, or lack of a better, quagmire of modernity? So again, uh, I'm opening this for discussion. I'll stop. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patience.